remix culture exists in all sorts of artistic mediums, games, music, people draw influences and recombine things in all sorts of ways without any sort of training data all the time. Hi everyone, welcome to the Metacast Roundtable by Navic. I'm back from holiday and I'm joined by David Amor, CEO of Playment, and Matt Dian, lead product manager at EA. Hello. Welcome back. Thank you. And that's, uh, I'm glad to be back. You know, as much as I love my family, I've got a job to do here. We're, we're pioneering new things. I've got games to make and uh, it's exciting, particularly the stuff that we're doing. I feel like if I'm away for a week, then uh, uh, I'm missing a lot. I'm sort of checking mm. Twitter and thinking, oh man, we need to be uh, plowing ahead. Now that said, things have moved on arguably more with me being away from the office than being in the office. But, <laughs> but nonetheless, it's nice to be back and uh, out the other side. How do you feel about that? That you went away and things were productive? <laughs> I mean, maybe I should go away more. But uh, <laughs> uh, no, I'm fine with that. That's how it should be. If everyone was waiting on me, then I'm not running the business in a particularly good way, am I? Wise words. Kicking it off strong, I see, David. <laughs> Did anyone here go to Gamescom? No. Wow. Nope. Sad face. Okay, we're the... How, how do you, we're, we're not part of all of, my whole LinkedIn page? It was everyone like, "Oh, Gamescom was amazing! I'm going to Gamescom." And I'm yeah, thinking, I think I'm it's not a, jealous. It's a really interesting show because it's primarily a uh, consumer show. So just uh, again, I, I can't remember exactly how many people, but I was just overwhelmed by the quantity of people showing up to play the games and how passionate they are, which mm. is always nice to see. But then also nice that it's absolutely crazy to uh, that, that show floor. So nice to retreat into the business section on the times that I've been there. But uh, I think people have fun there. Were there a lot of announcements? I think so. There's yeah. some pretty cool announcements. All right, maybe we're coming on to that. And it seemed like the Navic Deconstructor of Fun Party was also fun. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Okay. Get invite for that. We'll have to get Aaron and Manu <laughs> and Thomas on here for the full debrief. Oh yeah, Manny's on next week. I can I can debrief. Him. Oh, perfect. Debrief him live. Oh, and when I was in Argentina for my holiday, I met up with a listener, Delfina, who reached out. Um, she's a UA lead at Ethermax, and awesome. showed me Buenos Aires. Went out for dinner. Yeah, it's amazing. So, nice. listeners, if you visit London, let me return the favor. Um, I'll show you a nice a nice place to have dinner. That's there's probably more people listening from London than Argentina. Be careful with that that's <laughs> fine i like to socialize it's all good right, right. There, there are many restaurants to go to in london <laughs> so i'll never run out and last question before i move on to the topics has anyone seen the tekken anime on netflix no i have not don't don't it's not good <laughs> don't oh. it is not good i'm happy oh, to be challenged if anyone listening watched it um, because right after that, I watched the uh, Dota's anime. Yeah, I heard that That's, was very good. That is very good. It's excellent. I'm totally hooked on it. Tekken, sad, sad times. <sighs> Damning review. Yeah. yeah. Well, hopefully the next ones That's will be better. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So today we're going to be talking about AI art applied to games. There's something that came out of a rabbit hole that I don't think we'll ever go back to it. So we're going to go into that. Sony acquired Savage Game Studios from our friends, uh, well, Mishka, Deconstructor of Fun. So we'll go into that a little bit. And we're also going to be talking about AAA games, uh, well, AAA studios making crypto games. Uh, that will probably be a bit spicy. <laughs> so we'll see that. <laughs> Tell us about the rabbit hole. The rabbit hole. Okay, rabbit hole. I started seeing the words Dolly and mid, mid, mid Journey. Middle Journey, wait. Mid Journey. Mid Journey, mid -journey, journey yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. Going around everywhere. And I had no idea what it, what it was about. And it made me feel as when crypto games started to be talking about, where I qu quickly just felt like this mammoth. And so I had to go and explore what, what it is. So text to image generation has existed for a long time. I think the first time it was explored was about 50 years ago when, make, when an artist made a rules-based um, AI text to image 
or like it was teaching it rules to create art um, based on, on what he wanted. But now this is but Dolly and Midjourney, they're bringing this technology for free to the wider public, to the mass consumer. And so it's essentially democratizing the ability to place what you can see in your imagination um, to something visual that, that you can share. And we'll go into that a bit more. So there's just some little differences between Dali and Midjourney, and then there are others in the market, all focused on these two because they're the ones that are being mostly talked about and easily accessible. So Dali is in a closed beta and is developed by OpenAI, and Midjourney is in an open beta. And you just need to join Discord. You get 25 free um, text prompts that you can use, and then you can subscribe to, I think it's a membership or something where you can then do do more and you can even create them privately so that other people can see what, what you're creating. And so one thing that we'll be discussing is that existing art is used to train these models and different art can be used to train different kinds of models. So I know that Midjourney is exploring um, like models for different types, like if you want to do a photorealism or if you want to be doing more of a painting style or sci-fi style, I don't know. But they're exploring training different AI to be more specialized. And so the first thought angle, um, to keep my summary short, is that if AI is used to create these images and it was trained on art that is existing, so there were original creators, why outputs? Is it considered an original? So let's apply this to games. Can I use Midjourney or Dolly to create art, place it in my game, and then commercially distribute it? What do you think? You, commercially or ethically? Commercially. Well, I haven't read the T's and C's of, of either of those, but uh, let, if the question is, is that uh, given that it's based on somebody else's artwork that they created that is copyright, then do you have uh, are you legally allowed to distribute artwork that has been created based on that? Is that what you mean, Maria? Yes, because the the model doesn't output a copy, an exact copy of something that someone created. It it uses it uses existing art to be trained, and then it creates something that could be considered as unique. But is it unique if it's based on data? from other people's creations? Mm, I, have you ever seen, I mean, I've seen tons of these images and I have a, a Dali you know, account, so I've been using it myself. It's not clear to me, I, I've never seen, hey, this was the original image that it was used to be trained and therefore, hey, you asked for an elephant with a ball on its nose and we provided one, albeit with a different background, but this is the original image. So I don't have a good sense of how similar the AI generated images are to the original piece of artwork. Have you seen any of those kind of comparisons? So far, I haven't. I've seen claims from many artists saying that recombinations of existing artwork is not unique and cannot be an original, and that artist should be paid. So that is. Uh, one of the challenges with using this kind of technology. What do you think, Matt? I tend to disagree with that point of view. I'm not an artist, so I sh should say that first. But, um, <laughs> uh, you know, I think remix culture exists in all sorts of artistic mediums, games, music, uh, literature. Like people draw influences and recombine things in all sorts of ways without any sort of training data all the time. Um, so I think the, I guess the ethical burden is on the people making the AI models to source their training data, uh, properly and give credit where it's due. But as an end user, if I, let's say I want to make a game with Dolly or mid journey, uh, generated art, I don't have an issue with that. Uh, I don't know what Dolly's terms are. I had a brief look at mid journey and, you know, please correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think that you can. You can use it commercially, but you don't have exclusive um, IP right. rights to it. I think you share it with uh, with Midjourney. Um, so, you know, personally, I don't I don't have an issue with it because, you know, one, it's I think it's difficult to attribute the output of these models to any one particular piece of data or source image. Uh, maybe I'm wrong there, 
but also because remix culture happens all the time. Um, you know, if you think about like, there's uh there's about a hundred games that are like 1942, like the plane game that you're flying and you're just sort mm-hmm. of a vertical scroller. There's about a million variations of that. Uh, does all the all the royalties accrue back to the original one? Mm. I don't think so. Um, they're just sort of game design tweaks. Where did you get to on it, Maria? Uh, my heart and my head have different opinions. <laughs> I'm very much aligned with Matt, what Matt is saying there. I don't, I, I just can't help feeling with my heart that if you're using data to train a model, that data should at least be authorized to be used in some kind of way. Sure. Mm, sure. It, it, we've and we're culturally, we're sort of in a situation where anything that's on the internet becomes fair game to use in some in one way, you, you know, copyright aside but it's out there and sort of in the public domain and therefore you get to use that in lots of different ways it feels like um it's it feels like another case of where the people creating the content aren't really in control of what they put out there and so if there was a mechanism where people said hey i'm happy for my artwork to be used in training data for ai whatever that is whether it's art or you know brain scans for hospitals has also been the case then but you know every time you reference it i want to get a dollar or something then you think okay well i'm putting it out there but at least i'm being reimbursed for it i think a challenge is that you know if people are creating artwork based on yours that uh, that wouldn't exist without your artwork and you're not seeing anything from that that doesn't that's a little doesn't rest easily. How come I'm being the voice of it's unusual i'm the <laughs> voice. I'm usually the capitalist I know. <laughs> I'm sensitive, so really. <laughs> I, I was waiting for you to put a crypto spin on it. Hey, you know, I nearly, could you tell I nearly tokenized it? <laughs> yeah, I felt it was coming. If the training on, data is NFTs, you can track royalty payments. And yada, yeah. See, I don't have to. You see, you finish, you finish each other's sentences now. <laughs> I, I honestly think that that might become true in, in terms of IP, IP rights. Maybe blockchain will play a bigger part of this. I even remember when I was doing my postgrad and we had to write a thesis, most people in the class were using Google Images, images that they got from Google. Like, yeah. just because it's on Google Images, you can't <laughs> use it um, <laughs> without... I, I, had, I had an issue. Well, it wasn't, it's not an issue, but we, we uh, made a splash screen for our, our game. And um, it was the, the images, you know, had a logo across it and it had a very evocative sort of concept arty image that the art director gave me looks beautiful, really good. And then I was going to distribute it more widely. And then I thought, you know, I don't actually know where this piece of artwork's come from. I don't know if our art director did it or whether or not it's come from the internet or Unsplash. Or... And then I was thinking, oh, you could just run this through Dali or something and get something that's that's similar. But then I stopped and thought, well, I don't know if that's cool, because that will be a very quick solution for the problem where I don't really know if this is a copyright image or not. I'll just create something brand new with an AI solution and that can be our splash screen. And I think that can be our splash screen forever without having to pay anybody or worry about um, IP rights. So it feels like it's already, you know, that was, that happened to me this week uh, in game production. It's not, uh, this is happening now. This is not theory. Um, you know, what's ethical. It's, it's upon us now, I suppose. Yeah, I imagine a way to work around it is if the value is proven and the company is big enough, let's say a Ubisoft decides mm-hmm. or a Sony mm-hmm. decides to build a model with in-house proprietary art, they could potentially still have enough data to create a good model without infringing any kind of copyright with whatever it outputs. Yeah, yeah, maybe. I've also seen... Um that uh, some people are building sprite games using sprites that have been created in Dali. So rather than just concept art or reference, but actually sprites to be used directly in a game and having Mm -hmm. some amount of success with that. Um, So to actually not need to use an artist at all, or at least not a team of artists, but instead lean on AI is definitely a brand new idea. right? And that's what I love about this technology entering games just by some very brief conversations I had because I started exploring it and then I was, I was finding it very fun. And I asked if other people were exploring it 
the stream of messages and the amount of people who are already using it for their work in games was yeah, really? incredible. So yeah. our, an art director was using it to explore different um, art directions, like different different vibes, I guess, that they could give to to the game to get that different inspiration sources very quickly. It was being used by um, a founder of a company who was trying to create a pitch deck. And solo, he could just create these images and take what was in his imagination without any artistic skills and be able to put it in a pitch deck. Um, product managers and game designers using it again to just exemplify the feeling that they like to achieve with a goal that they have to then go go to an artist to to develop yeah i i'm very excited i think i think reducing the barriers for people to be creative is extremely important even more so in a creative product like games hmm. i think the applications are fascinating um you know it could be something like helping to generate UA creatives really quickly. Mm -hmm. um, or like I saw on Twitter a while back, someone did a choose your own adventure uh, kind of text game. And the images that accompanied the, the text were all generated by Dolly. Um, but it, it's, it's fascinating. Like you, you, we could probably talk about this for a long time. And this is definitely my new favorite genre <laughs> of Twitter thread for sure. <laughs> um, one, one point that I wanted to bring up was I, I've noticed people saying the art, the artistry is really in, it's no longer in making the image, it's in generating the prompt, mm -hmm. the, the prompt that you feed to Dolly or to Mid Journey. Um, and that seems to really ring true with me, at least. Um, you, I think you get far more effective results when you include stuff like, I don't know, like extremely high detail, 4K art station blender like all these terms that are not necessarily descriptive of like what you're representing but like more about the quality of the image i don't know it's, it's really odd it's like kind of mm -hmm. turns it on its head a little bit yeah maybe that becomes a new skill in the art department is, i think so we yeah, are figuring out how to uh give the correct prompts what about i mean you're in the business of making bigger games matt and, you know, what we're talking about so far is 2D images that sort of set the scene, concept art, uh, that kind of thing. Do you ever see that making its way into 3D assets, animations? Um, I don't see why not. I don't think the, you know, these programs aren't, aren't built for 3D at the moment, but uh, I don't see why not. Like, there's, there's different, <clears throat> different parts of the pipeline. So it could be used extensively in the concepting phase, but if you've got a big, IP that you're working on, like I am, for example, I think you need to be a little bit more careful about like what the output is. It needs to adhere mm -hmm. to certain brand guidelines and you sort of have a art Bible that you're kind of sticking to. So there's, there's some limitations, but if it's a brand new IP and we're still kind of concepting, I don't see why not. Um, another potential application is like, there are all these um, needs for like meta art. Let's say you need like some sort of image as a backdrop for your UI, like you're running some events or something and you need a meta art that just shows some soldiers right. on a battlefield, you know, like you could kind of quickly spin something up there, probably save a lot of money from a production standpoint too. Yeah. Sometimes it's hard to encourage artists to use things other than the things they build themselves. So for, for a long time, I, I've loved the Unity Assets store. It's got so many assets, animations, this kind of thing. In there. And it's great for getting something up and running quickly. And often the assets, you know, they're very high quality, but it, but it's I think if you're an artist, you generally sooner build it yourself, take some discipline to um, to say, yes, I could uh, mm -hmm. uh, I could build it myself, but instead I'm going to go the easy route and, and pull something that maybe not as quite good as the, the, they feel they could have done themselves. But, uh, you know, so there's a bit of a cultural issue there in using uh, art that isn't ge in generated in-house as well, I think. Are you using uh, in-house, Maria, or not? What can you say? Within Hutch, if we're using uh -huh. these programs. Uh -huh. Yep. Mm, no, <laughs> some people are using it to explore in the personal time and still it's still in a just feeling, feeling at stage and yeah. trying to understand its potential. It's not officially being used for anything that, that we're developing. Uh, one thing that definitely excites me that Matt um, touched upon is for marketability testing and potentially for UA. If you can very quickly create many variants that are interesting 
uh, to start give you some some direction as part of I don't know maybe market analysis, competitive analysis, before having an artist dedicated to exploring the direction that that costs. Yeah, it could be extremely interesting. Um, I do think this might change. Uh, like you were saying, David, it might bring in a new type of role because usually you have data scientists who have nothing related to art. And then you have artists and then you have tech artists who kind of go in between the engineering and the art. Um, I think we might also see a kind of new role of uh, a data scientist artist where, as with that artist about 50 years ago who created his own model based on rules to, to output mm -hmm. art, you could have an artist that knows how to do some machine learning um, and AI rules-based to aid this in, in the processes. So like we were saying, Matt, if you have a design a design Bible, some guidelines that you need to abide by. I've seen some people claim that this is going to eliminate artists in their jobs, maybe in 10 years. I don't think so, personally. Mm. I think whatever you output, at least I've never worked with any kind of AI that could function without humans, at least, uh, I think it's called post, oh no. I lost a, I lost a phrase. You were going to sound amazing then. I know. Um, <laughs> it's, it's not. It's like cleaning cleaning up the data and the results, but cleaning is not a pretty word. It has okay. a much fancier word. <laughs> Escape you. What about you? Were saying to me another time, Maria, about the fact that the results presented aren't particularly ethically or culturally diverse. Is that an issue? Yes, I've even noticed this in Mid Journey. So it's just a known problem with any kind of machine learning. If you use biased data to train it, it will have a biased output. And you can already see that in mid-journey where someone had typed uh, African-American and Latin or Latinx. And it, had, it was just outputting traditional stereotypes of what people with these backgrounds um, right. look like. And so... I, this this is another reason why I think artists won't go away because I don't think we're ever going to reach a place where we can teach AI how to know the entire world and diversity and inclusion. Even within a company, a single artist can't do that. This is why yeah, you need yeah. people with different backgrounds and working together as a team and calling each other out to, to resolve um, problems and how we're doing representation. So it sounds like you're suggesting that the f artists in the future are going to be trying to correct the mistakes of the uh, data set that have been looked at. So draw ethnically correct Mexicans and uh, African-Americans, et cetera, in order to correct the sample data or something. Well, in, in terms of uh, diversity and inclusion, but also in terms of guidelines like Matt was mentioning or taking something that's a baseline and bringing it up to standards to what the output is desired by the art director. No, I, I, I see, I see. Yeah, I, I've never seen any kind of AI or machine learning that didn't need a human intervention. Like maybe a listener can correct me, maybe there is an example where a, a model out there is so advanced that it doesn't need any kind of um, human input. But even when you're using the model, it, for example, with Mid Journey, when it outputs, it gives you four options, and then you choose one of the options, and you can keep iterating it. You can use different prompts. I think maybe what will happen is that the original idea or the original concepts might come from a model, and then it will go to the artist to take the exploration further. Right, it will right. become part of ideation. Hey, well, here's a thought. Are you watching that ILM show? Do you know this I, show? Uh, Industrial. It's called Light and Magic, the Disney show. So it's yeah. it's chronic. First of all, you should see that. Second thing is it's a without putting too many spoilers. It's about industrial light and magic. Of course, we made Star Wars, and then you know went on to do many things in the effects department. And there's a sort of again without trying to spoil it too much. There was a point when it went from physical to digital, and uh, you know a lot of the people that really specialised in in a physical we're now being replaced by digital, like Jurassic Park, you know, that kind of thing. But, you know, has, because those tools have become easier to build more art, then has that decreased the quantity of artists? No, it's become, you know, debatably easier to make a greater quantity of art, but it hasn't reduced the amount of artists. It's probably increased the amount of artists because the amount of art that's been created that way is just so much larger. So maybe we'll see something similar happen there. 
One thing I think we might see is um, increasing specialization. Um, I don't know, you know, how or where Dolly and Midjourney source their training data, but presumably it's like the whole internet, right? Yeah. And yeah. so, to your point earlier, Maria, about you know needing human intervention, you know, perhaps we're going to see additional models that are more specialized. Um, so let's say. Um, this model is, uh, particularly good at generating prompts, um, that are, I don't know, fantasy style, like mm -hmm. fantasy art style mm -hmm. or medieval or wild west or something like that. Maybe we even get to a point where you have, um, publishers that have their own like massive library of assets that they can pull from to kind of stay within uh, brand uh, guidelines yeah, or art viable. It's like, we don't have to go kind of concept a bunch of new stuff. We have a, a, an entire set of training data from our, you know, hundred previous titles that we've released and we're just going to feed it into our own proprietary model. Um, so perhaps we'll see more specialized applications hmm. um, that are, yes, they do require human intervention, but they're intentionally limited in scope. So as not to, you know, pull in bias or to be very like, Hyper targeted at a specific use case or visual style. That's a yeah, good, that's a good idea. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, and since I I started doing little bold predictions in Nico style uh, with the um, with the Unity Iron Source app loving. Mm -hmm. By the way, you called it. I call it. I, it. Yeah, I know. I was, I, yes. I'm, I'm wondering if Riccatelli actually took your advice and listened to the podcast and thought, you know, oh. I'm, go I'm not going to go with the app loving. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would be very surprised in the next two, three years, Unity, either Unity and or Unreal have some kind of partnership or acquire one of oh, these yeah, text, text to image and they do an integration in the game engine. And whenever you're designing anything, maybe it has a way, like with the sprite characters, maybe there'll be a way to do um, exploration of what it could look like and then it automatically rigs it up. Or if you're designing an environment and you need a banner, you can just write something and it will populate. Um, we see we've seen Unity's strategy to do a lot of integration with workflows with artists, so that they might be the first to at least do a partnership. Mm. Yeah, I, th I think I think again, it's the rabbit that came out of the hole, and the rabbit's not going to go back in. It's <laughs> you're being mixing, you're, you're mixing your metaphors there. I Am I? Ra yeah, rabbits come out of hats. People go yeah. down rabbit holes, but it doesn't oh, matter. You know, I, I get but that's the, the merge. Different directions. Oh, well, where where are the rabbits? <laughs> <laughs> Okay. I actually, I don't think that's a particularly bold prediction. I have to say, wow. I think it's going to wow. happen. Okay. I think it's going to happen. Like it just, we're, we're only talking about images, right? No, I mean, you're, you're hundred percent right. Is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, 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 um, yeah, yeah. That we're only talking about AI generated images. AI is going to change a lot of things. It will like, go to video. AIs, we're gonna, yeah. Video. We're going to have AIs yeah, yeah, writing yeah, yeah, their yeah, yeah. own code um, in the not too distant future. Like, I don't think it's yeah. crazy to, say that there will be AI generated games entirely. You know, yeah. if you think about like how simple something like a hyper casual game is, mm -hmm. and then you just feed a training data set of hyper casual games to a model and it starts putting out its own in Unity, Unreal, something like that. I think that's totally within the realm of possibility. I'm not comfortable yeah. with this future you described, Matt. Everyone should start doing four day work weeks and start yeah. getting used to having more free time. Okay. I'm comfortable with four-day work. <laughs> I'm comfortable with that future. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, uh, we'll carry on, uh, Matt. All right. Um, so, changing, uh, changing topic slightly. Uh, so, uh, very recently, uh, Sony acquired a company called Savage Game Studios. Um, so, you may know Savage Game Studios as the studio that was founded by. Uh, Mishka Kakoff and a couple of others. Uh, Mishka, of course, being the founder of Deconstructor of Fun, our friends over there. Uh, so congratulations to them. Uh, I just want to give a shout out to the other co-founders. I uh, apologize in advance if I'm butchering your names. Uh, Nod Ajir, he was ex of Wargaming and Gree, and Michael McManus, ex of Wargaming and Kabam. Um, so they were, uh, they were acquired for um, an undisclosed amount by Sony just the other day. And they are said to be working on, uh, I've lost my notes here, a mobile, I believe it's like mobile action game. Um, and we'll come back to that in a minute. But, um, 
you know, they were they were started a couple of years ago. They had 4.4 million in seed funding from Makers Fund, Play Ventures, a few others. They're going to be a part of a newly formed PlayStation Studios mobile division. Uh, and I'm quoting here, which will operate separately from the console business and focus on mobile titles using either new IP or existing PlayStation IP. Um, and uh, just a quote from Mishka. So he said, we made this deal because we believe that PlayStation Studios leadership respects our vision for how we can best operate and succeed. And because they too are not afraid to take chances. All of that, plus the ability to potentially tap into PlayStation's amazing catalog of IP and the fact that we'll benefit from the kind of support that only they can provide. There are a number of um, references in the articles I was reading about this uh, story to tapping into PlayStation IP, uh, which I would love to get your thoughts on, like what IP we think they might be working on. Before I f- turn that over to you both, um, I had previously heard that they were making a shooter game on mobile. But all the articles I was reading just say it's just a mobile action game. So I don't know if that's changed. Um, but this is my this is my understanding. It, I tend to follow this sh- space. It was a shooter. It was a shooter, game. right? Yeah, yeah. 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 I tend to follow it closely working on a, a shooter myself. So I'll be excited to see what they put together and if it remains a shooter or if it's just an action game. But um, yeah, congrats to the team. I think that's awesome. Um, but this is brand new for Sony. And uh, before, well, let's just talk about Savage Games for a moment. Like, what do we think they're they're doing here? Do we th- have any guesses as to what the IP might be? Are they going to do a new IP? Or are they going to um, sort of borrow a Sony IP and put it on their action slash shooter mobile game? I think Sony would prioritize bringing their existing IPs to mobile because one of their goals that they stated was that by 2025, they want half of their games to be on PC and mobile, and they've started doing ports to PC already. So I would expect it's an existing IP and not something new. I won't dare say what IP that could be. <laughs> what do you think, Matt? Well, I think you ha- you're thinking What are the something. options? Um, I, I don't have any strong leads, but some of the options, like if I'm thinking of a shooter, Last of Us maybe is the best fit for that. Um, could be Horizon if it's like a bow and arrow shooter. <laughs> uh, but shooter could be a lot of things, right? Like it could be a first person shooter. It could be a top down Brawl Stars type shooter. Uh, Mishka did work at Supercell, I should say. Um, you know, it, it could be a lot of things. We're just speculating here. Um, it could be Ratchet and Clank. So this it is could be Ratchet and this Clank. is one of the first <laughs> mobile games I would bet Sony would bring to mobile. Here's something to consider is that, let me just see when they got their funding. Because it feels like, what, a couple of years ago that they got their funding? Yeah, I think it was two, three years ago. Yeah, I'm looking at a, um, yeah, okay. So my point is that having raised $4.5 million, $4.4 million, and been around for two, three years, then presumably they have a game that exists. You know, and there's nothing soft launch, right? I haven't seen anything. Uh, But my point is that uh, they either will have had to have killed the game that they're working on, in which case uh, that seems like a strange acquisition to... Anyway, I don't know. So they've either killed the game that they're working on or they've adapted the game that they're working on or it's a brand new IP. Uh, I can't... It, it, you know, if it, oh, it's a brand new title, I should say. So it would be surprising to me if they've thrown away two, three years of work to then just start working immediately on something else. Um so maybe you know there's a i my guess would be a new ip that's right for mobile uh or an adapted one i suppose that's that's sort of shoehorned in i don't know not sure you, you make a good there. point about the timeline right mm. so if they've been working for two to three years they probably have something built um but is it like in a stage where they can very easily tack on an ip I would think maybe not. Maybe it's already kind of yeah. fairly, that would be a lot of rework, right? At least on the, the art side, I would imagine. And so maybe it's like they've got their first product, uh, which is a new IP and uh, Sony feels confident in the product, what it's going to be. And they're really investing in the next game, uh, which will be a Sony IP. Right. Well, and, I, and, so Sony, Sony mentioned that they were going to keep their console dev separate from mobile. So it could also be that Savage Game Studios is being onboarded to help build out that strategy because they might 
how, who are you going to code dev with? Are you going to do any partnerships? Are you going to do more acquisitions? And they could bring the know-how on how developing on how to develop a successful uh, mobile game with free to play. I, I was going to read this from the, this is when they got their funding announcement, whenever that was, a couple of years ago. All the shoot. This is uh, Mishka. All of the shooter games since the start of Battle Royale boom in 2018 have focused on the competitive, fast-paced gameplay. We see there as an opening for games that offer an opportunity to play with others and have rewarding sessions without the high pressure of PvP environment. What games um, are those? I, I just want to make a call to Savage Game Studios and Sony. Can you Go please on. bring Destiny to mobile? Please. <laughs> So can that, that's can an, that be my that's wish? A great segue. Good. Well <laughs> um, there, there have been reports that there's a Destiny mobile game. No. In the works. Yeah, yeah. <gasps> I, no way. It's, it's uh, yeah, it's NetEase and Bungie. Um, and obviously Bungie coming under Sony. <laughs> um, now, the I think the article I was reading was like it was pulled from a LinkedIn post or something. So take that you know, with a grain of salt, but, um, that is, uh, something I had thought about as well. You know, that's, that's an obvious shooter right there. Bungie coming over to Sony. Um, yeah, maybe it's, maybe it's your time, Maria. <laughs> well, all right. And can I make another point overall though, isn't the bigger news story that PlayStation are going jumping in with both feet. Well, actually I think Matt, you have a better understanding than I do have Sony made this size of play into mobile Previously, I haven't been keeping track. I don't think so. So I, this is really their first play to say, okay, we're dedicating a new vertical in our games business, which is mobile. And as you said, Maria, it's not going to plug into Shuhei or, you know, however that works. And instead, it's going to be its own thing over here. And and that, you know, is, is moving Sony uh, Computer Entertainment into uh it, away from being exclusively about playstation and i, I guess they do some pc but you know into mobile now and sure. they're, i guess the last right but but you know very late play into mobile i suppose that if you're in the games business then you can only you know all of these companies ea activision and finally you can only ignore mobile for so long way right? mm -hmm. if it feels like a clear play in terms of the business strategy you need to increase growth console wars there's there's only so much you can do to improve hardware. What well, what are you going to do next? Open up new markets. New markets are new new platforms, mobile and PC, that were widely untapped by by Sony. I remember having a conversation uh, about hang on a second, what was that? Microsoft Activision with you guys on this podcast, I think, and and saying, Hey, I wonder whether or not uh hang on a second, Activision is still gonna be putting out their PlayStation titles now they're acquired by Microsoft. And I remember you saying to me, Matt, well of course, yeah, you know, it's all about just making money from ent yeah. entertainment uh, games IP now. And so maybe and to me that's like I'm a bit more old school where I think there's a clear link between the hardware and the uh, and the software, and so the idea that they wouldn't be exclusive to those platforms is surprising. But maybe it's just that's just the way things are now. You just make the most of whatever uh, gaming IP that you have, regardless about what platform it's going to run on. Is that it? Possibly. I mean, I, I think it's interesting to compare this uh, Sony move to Microsoft on one hand as the other console, and Nintendo as the other hardware maker, and how mm -hmm. they've both approached mobile. Microsoft. I get the impression their mobile approach is like through the cloud streaming and yep. they're, they're not really doing like a dedicated mobile gaming free to play approach. Maybe I'm yep. wrong. Um, uh, and Nintendo taking the opposite approach, which is I think going to be a little bit more similar to what Sony is doing. Um, although I don't think Nintendo has dedicated mobile studios. I think they work with others and they kind of yeah. like co-develop. Yeah, so. Um, yeah, so. so yeah, it's just an interesting comparison between the three. Um, that's a really but good point, to your about, point about Xbox. Yeah, sorry, go ahead, Marie. No, sorry, I just yes. want to say there's a really good point about Xbox in the comparison. Sorry, carry on. Oh, that's okay. I, I was going to say, um, uh, mm, lost my train of thought. Oh, yeah, yeah, David, you were saying it was um, their first kind of uh, foray into mobile. Yeah. And you're right. I think it is. They have done some mobile games through their crunchy roll division. And they have like a couple. I was looking on, on one of the data providers yesterday as I was doing my research and um, they have a couple of games, but nothing, you know, chart topping, noteworthy. They have a couple team battlers and, and things like that. But yeah, this is definitely like a, 
a big first step, albeit a late one, but it's a yeah. big first step. Well, and, and mobile games largely rely on their live games. They rely on live content and that know-how. And that I think that plays even more into the Bungie because the acquisition of Sony with Bungie was to gain that knowledge that Bungie has from you know having two very successful live games with Destiny and Destiny 2. So bringing that then into mobile, that would be amazing. One thing I thought was interesting, and maybe this will be my my last point on this story, is is that point about Bungie. Um, I see parallels working at EA to respawn. Um, you know, Bungie is not a part of the mobile division, as far as I understand it. At Sony, this is a brand new thing that Savage Game Studios is kind of leading up. Um, EA acquired respawn, and respawn is kind of its own thing. But they also do Apex Mobile, which is a mobile game, but it's like separate from EA Mobile, kind mm-hmm. of. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm sort of drawing parallels there. Maybe I'm completely off base and that's just my bias as an EA employee, but, um, it'll be interesting. It's not like good or bad. It's just an observation. Do you exchange knowledge? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. c- certainly I do working on a shooter. Um, I have, I have you know, relatively frequent contact with the folks at Respawn. Um, but that is always a challenge to be clear it is like getting out of your silo and reaching out and sharing learnings with other studios, mm-hmm. not just at EA, at all large organizations. Um, you know, I, when I was in business school, I did a consulting project with Sony, uh, not on games, but on their animation department. And that was some of the feedback I got was that they tend to be like, now granted this was a few years back, but um, they tend to be a very siloed organization in that animation only talks to animation, Sony Pictures only talks to Sony Pictures, PlayStation only talks to PlayStation, and so on and so forth. So bridging those gaps and sharing learnings is a challenge for any large organization. Mm. Yeah. On on challenges for large organizations. Hey. Should we go to David's topic? <laughs> All right. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I saw a couple of things announced at uh, at Gamescom, you know, more traditional games event, I suppose. And there was, you know, I'm wondering if it was the first uh, wave of AAA games that use blockchain. And actually, you know, first of all, I'm going to make a bit of a definition, point of definition here. You know, as, I, I'm, as you know, I'm working in this field myself, and uh, I've sort of come to the conclusion that there's going to be games that use blockchain. Like, for instance, they might store their digital assets that you buy on a blockchain instead of in the game. And then there's also, let's call them blockchain games, that a new kind of games that, you know, pe- people are figuring out now. Now, uh, there's a couple of games that were announced um, at uh, Gamescom. The first one was called Off the Grid, a treble A console game by Neil Blomkamp. He's the guy b- behind District 9. And I think a lot of gamers are excited that he's sort of, what that guy would create and uh, from the trailers and all the sizzle it looked like it was going to be something exciting it looks like it is going to be something exciting and i think somewhere i think somebody spotted a job ad for the company that said hey we, we're hiring for people that understand smart contracts and that sort of uh, raised the alert i suppose see i'm doing it now anyway the other one is everywhere so everywhere is a game that uh, leslie benzie's studio is building and this, you know, I, I know a little bit about that development. I know it's enormous. You know, Leslie is producer behind GTA titles and uh, split off from the houses a little while ago and has been building this enormous game. And and again, you know, is in both cases, I think that what they're saying is that the digital assets are being uh, uh, held as NFTs, i.e. you own them as NFTs rather than being held within the game itself. And then, you know, you're you know, they haven't said a lot more than that. But I suppose, uh, first of all, that's, for me, I think the first time that real AAA, and obviously Ubisoft, have, you know, dabbled a little bit. But here, this is a AAA game that's brand new, brand new IP, hundreds of millions of dollars probably to create, and um, and using NFTs in some way there. And so that's notable. And then the other thing that's notable but not notable, I suppose, is the way that the press really jumped on that as being the a reason to crucify the game overall. So I think it's interesting that gamers and the gaming press seemed really excited about those games until it became it seemed that NFTs were going to be used in some way. And, um, you know, I suppose to me, uh, I suppose that's it. The, 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 I've seen negative press reaction and at least within the 
vocal gamers have also added comments to say, right, I was, I thought this game was going to be amazing, but now I've heard it has NFTs in it, then uh, I'm never going to touch it. And uh, it's a reminder to me, I suppose, that uh, what I, I've always thought should be a good thing for gamers, if done right, like you own those things that you buy and are free to buy and um, sell with whoever, the secondhand market, that's always seemed like a good thing, not a bad thing. But it's a reminder to me that even when it's been handled quite carefully, it's still the kiss of death for treble A games. And, and I suppose the first question is to you guys is, um, you know, when I read the, I, I read a GI.biz piece and a Eurogamer piece on these games, and both were really, I had to read them twice to see, hang on, is this an opinion piece or is it, is it editorial? Is <laughs> I it was news? going to, to actually <laughs> lean on that. Yeah. yeah. Cause I mean, they're really fanning the flames yeah. <laughs> saying like, here's reasons you should hate this game. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> And I don't know, you know, it doesn't feel like news anymore. It's starting to feel a bit like opinion. What do you, I don't know, lots of things there. What do you think is going on, guys? You go, Matt. Well, so I would start with like, what is the definition of AAA? And why does that make it any? Oh, wow. Oh, he went higher up. Okay. Yeah. David? Oh, why is it any different? I suppose that... uh, <laughs> okay, so there's a, you know, a category of games that uh, represents about, what would we say, about a third of the games industry by revenue. And uh, it seems like using NFTs to attract digital ownership in those games is a great use case of the blockchain. But um, uh, games to date, you know, those games to date haven't used it. And so this is... Uh, I, I guess why it's significant is that maybe a third of the gaming market by revenue has started to introduce NFTs into the, in, you know, that category. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, I think of AAA in terms of like production quality and, and scale and um, may, maybe, maybe it's just like AAA is the closest thing to the traditional PC console era of games that this sort of, uh, backlash tends to come from like the same backlash that we got to free to play mobile games, uh, which uh, until the last maybe three ish, five ish years, mobile games also did not really have triple a quality games. Now they do, I would argue, but um, yeah, to me, it's, it's just like a benchmark for quality and polish and maybe scope. Um, But it doesn't, it doesn't touch on business model or technology so much and so to me it's like the triple the triple a aspect is more feeding into the backlash than it is to anything else like you, i think you can apply blockchain technologies to single a games indie games like it doesn't really make a difference yeah. in, in in my opinion it's it's more about like how you use it um I, but i i, I think this triple a and, and, you know, you could say like attaching big names like Neil Blomkamp, Leslie Benzies to these games that lends it more credence as a quote unquote triple A title. Um, so, I, you know, I could see that. But I, I think that's where the the backlash comes from. If if I had to take a quick read on this is like, um, you know, the PC console crowd, they don't want NFTs in their games. <clears throat> and these are games that they would excuse me, otherwise be excited about because of their polish and scope and whatnot and the big names attached to them that they are suddenly, I guess, disappointed in. I might disagree a tiny bit. Um, Please. I I think AAA games are still seen as the pinnacle, the enshrined protection of what a game experience is. You have this super polished experience. You have to own a console. You play it at home. It's um, it's a different setting from playing a mobile game. And it's a premium experience where you pay a hefty price and then that experience is protected. And we're still seeing a lot of backlash of premium games that then have free-to-play elements in them. I think exactly because of these reasons, because it's no longer a, a protected experience that you're, that you're having. And because of the revenue that they generate and the different kind of experience, I think seeing, I think seeing 
blockchain being used in AAA games would solidify blockchain as a used technology with more, how do you call it, reputation? Legitimacy. Legitimacy, mm. that's the word, mm. than being used, for example, in mobile. Because mobile still has a, a lot of, um, oh, I can't remember the word in English, a judgment. Like if you play mobile games or if you make mobile games, it's still seen as inferior. It's still seen as um, not as premium as as console. And so I think I think that psychological factor of bringing legitimacy is still is still important with AAA. I, I would uh, push back a little bit in the sense that like. I, I see that as like a very Western point of view. I don't disagree, by the way. Yeah. But like, there's a whole part of the world that just like never had the console PC generation. They went straight mm -hmm. to mobile, and exactly, so yeah. you and I might think that like consoles are kind of the pinnacle of, or PCs are the pinnacle of gaming experiences. But that's based on our history with games and having played them on PC and console as 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 kids, and we were sort of first experiencing games. I develop mobile games, so I don't agree with whatever I just said. Um, <laughs> I, I don't, I don't agree that they're less, but I can't like that. Yeah, I think yeah. that is a present mindset in the Western games market. And yeah, I, I was going to say, do you think that uh, it, it seems to be a worse reaction than if either of those games said, "Hey, we're going to have IAPs in this game"? Yes, yeah, it's still at an even earlier stage because. It's been a few years since gamers have started to see free-to-play elements in games. And you have AAA console games that are free-to-play, um, like Destiny and uh, Warframe, Fortnite. So there is, I think that the public has had time to become more accustomed to seeing that. Mm -hmm. But blockchain is new, new. And so the backlash will be even harsher. Well, and and the, I think Matt made this point that there was in the, there was in the detail, the implementation... So if, and I don't know one way or the other, but if these games genuinely just use the blockchain for digital ownerships of, uh, of things that people buy in a game, then that's genuinely, well, I can't think how it isn't, that's a genuinely better model than the existing model where the items that you own are trapped on a server that you, you know, can do limited things with. So it, it, that, I would think, is a uh, a better implementation than the current one we have, but I don't know what implementation they're planning. Why are you smiling, yeah. Marianne? Because I was going to say, is it, is it really? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that Depends is Depends who you ask. It has still too much friction and too many dangers because if it's locked in a okay. server, I have some guarantee that whatever I pay, I'll get no friction. I can use it immediately. With like the blockchain, I think yeah, I think you're right. Maybe in five years' time, okay, but yeah. but right now there's so much friction, and you have to create a wallet. And then if you link your wallet to the wrong place, you can lose something. You can lose something that you own. So it's ownership, but risky, risky friction. Yeah. So ownership. okay. So in, in principle, uh, yes, David. But in practice, no, David, because you know wallets <laughs> and the UX surrounding them are horrific right now. And then if you want to trade, you have to, currently, I think, generally, you have to go to a, a marketplace and you can't even do it in-game. And yeah, and then I, I, whenever I open OpenSea, I just see a lot of bad quality stuff sold there. And then that immediately just tanks okay. my experience. Yeah, yeah, okay. I, okay, I mean, that's, the ecosystem. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, um, down, down I, to the implementation. Go on. I do want to touch upon the journalism aspect because I have seen on multiple occasions official sources of news stating an article as being news and not an opinion piece. And then they show a lot of personal opinions about blockchain. Mm -hmm. I think news industry, we have to protect it. It's super important to be impartial and be have some kind of assurance that investigation has been done and is factual contrary to a lot of social media um, where everyone can be an expert if you say something loud enough. And I, I, I feel that this is affecting the legitimacy of the news even further. That if you can report something about this and just put your personal opinion on it about how horrible it is. Yeah, I mean, it's a problem with media in general, perhaps, but it's not a bad commercial strategy to write content that chimes with the people audience that's your audience right so yeah, you know, i'm sure right. those uh, 
I don't like it. I think it's a real shame. I don't think it should be the case, but you could say the same with Fox News or, you know, plenty of other places. Oh, yeah, that... definitely. This is a much wider <laughs> conversation than here. Yeah, and, you know, I, I, I like Gamer Network. You know, I like those sites generally. Um, it, it, it's interesting to me that they who generally, I think, take a, are quite careful about their editorial policy, uh, just letting it all hang out when it comes to blockchain. It's like, hey, you hate it, we hate it. Let's talk about how much we hate it. <laughs> So, I, and you know, I don't know if uh, I don't know if that's cool or not. It certainly doesn't help. You know, I, I genuinely think that you know, certainly the things we're doing, and I see lots of my peers doing, are doing genuinely new and interesting things in the games industry. But a barrier that we're going to have to get over at some point if we're to reach a mar wider market is say, I know that this is your opinion on that, and yes, that has been true to some extent, but this is something different. There is an environmental issue. It's not scammy. This is a new kind of game that happens to use blockchain. Uh, but that feels like an uphill battle um, right now. This is why I think it's important for AAA games to start integrating these blockchain elements. I think it will also push the innovation to have a frictionless experience for, for players. And if anyone can do it, I believe in Neil Blomkamp. Blomkamp. Because District... Dist Wait, what was it? Blomkamp, right? Blomkamp. Blomkamp. Yeah. Because both District 9 and Chappie, their movies are very different. They go against the grain of what cinema is. And, and, so, they, and they have respect of those gamers. You're right. So, so it's a shame that... Uh, and the other thing that stuck in my throat a little bit is when somebody saw that job ad and say, hang on a minute, wait a minute, what's going on here? Then there was a very apologist uh, response from that developer saying, well, well yeah, hey, hey, wait a minute. You don't, don't worry. Yo, we're, not, we're just doing some experiments, and, you know. We're cool. Stick and it was <laughs> and it was technically inaccurate as well. Oh yeah, you know. I think it, maybe it, they should have prepared their response a bit better. <laughs> yes. And you they could have prepared for that. They I mean they and they could have done, right? <laughs> they yeah, could have predicted that response. <laughs> so what was inaccurate <laughs> is that they claimed they were developing the game on Unreal. And so that meant they weren't going to be using blockchain. It was all on Unreal. Unreal and mean. blockchain can work together. Unreal is just a game engine. <laughs> I know. Yeah, it's someone in the PR department wrote that, I think. Ah, <laughs> uh, potentially, yeah. <laughs> cool. So, I, I, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I don't know. Uh, it, it's uh, The battle is going to go on for some time longer. Uh, generally, my opinion on this is like there's talking the talk and walking the walk, right? Mm -hmm. I can, I can, you know, personally describe how I think we're making a different kind of game and it's not scammy, and but ultimately – the only way to really prove it is to put a game out there and see what people think of it. Well, That's... Matt is a great reporter of Web3 games, crypto games, with an impartial <laughs> product view. All right. I need to. Uh, mm, keep, I wouldn't call myself it. a reporter. All right. <laughs> we'll wrap it up. Um, if you want to join the discussion, you can find us on the Navic Discord. Thank you for listening, and we'll be here next week. Bye, everyone. Awesome.